The Lord be with you. Again, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, hopefully you've been enjoying the first hour, and I know you enjoyed supper because there's no way you couldn't have enjoyed supper. Uh, and so what we're going to do again uh, is we'll have uh, Molly. She's going to give a few remarks here for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, because we are videotaping this, if you do have a question that you'd like to ask, we're going to ask that you come forward and speak into the microphone. When you speak into the microphone, it picks it up on the recording devices uh, so people can hear what the questions that are being asked. So if you would do that, I will turn the mic here and just uh, kind of come down and just line up along the side here uh, for your questions. We'd appreciate that. And so, uh, again, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mrs. Molly Hemingway. Does that work? So now that I do all this TV stuff, I've gotten really good at like putting in earpieces and doing microphones, and I'm so technologically illiterate that this is a miracle that I'm not, you know, like, ah! But um, that's always a fun experience. Okay, so I wanted to just talk a little bit more about persecution since I'm so obsessed with this topic, and then we can talk about anything far afield from my obsession on this. But one of the things I always think is funny about Christians is that eventually we all seem to think that we are in the very last days. Like you read any Christian throughout any period and that, that you will come across them being like, certainly we are in the last days. Obviously the very first Christians thought this to the point that they didn't even really lay down everything that they needed to believe because they just were assuming that at any minute the second coming would occur. And if you read Martin Luther, who sounds like he is writing for this very moment, he will say, certainly, there's no, there's no doubt we are in the very last days. <laughs> and I think we get that way too. You know, we'll look around and say, oh, things are really bad. And we assume that we must be approaching the end. Although I also have the problem of imagining just how much worse things could get. So I'm kind of on, on both sides of it. But whether or not it can get worse or it's really bad or that the end will come quickly and that the decline will start accelerating, it is true that we are in the last days and that's been true ever since Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven. And we should be thinking about what that means. And with regard to the persecution, I think, you know, because it's not beheadings or killings that we're experiencing, we tend to dismiss what is happening in this country as not being a huge deal. It can even seem rude to talk about bad things that are happening in this country when you think of how our brethren in other countries can't even go to church without facing, you know, a firebomb or execution or they might be kidnapped or somehow treated really horribly on account of their faith. You know, whatever we're going through is not really that big of a deal. But it can also be far more insidious to our faith if what we suffer is it can be even more dangerous if the, if the means that Satan uses is damage to your reputation, loss of job, loss of career path, uh, loss of family, friends. These things can in some ways be more difficult for us to face than a really stark choice like what the northern Nigerian I told you about had to deal with. Um, if we think it's not that big of a deal, to answer something a certain way or to not stand up for the truth, that can be very damaging to our faith and we should be on guard. I recently went to a religious liberty conference and I heard this Cuban dissident speak and I was really struck by how he became a dissident. He'd spent 20 years in a Cuban prison, he was a postal worker and everyone had put up a, a sign, like the green grocery sign, that said, I'm with Fidel. He didn't do it. They didn't like that he didn't do it. They were like, you need to put up your sign. He was like, or I don't. And they put him in prison and tortured him. Other dissidents, he opposed Fidel Castro on account of how, he was a, of how this dissident was a Christian and Fidel Castro was violating religious liberty. All these other Christians were imprisoned. They were executed. 
He said that he would hear as they executed these prisoners, that they would shout out that Jesus Christ was their savior. He would hear it you know, in the courtyard of the prison where he was. One of the people who was in prison with him had a daughter that he met and fell in love with. And she stood by him for 20 years, not married, just they, they loved each other. And she brought attention to his cause so that he couldn't be killed, basically. Amnesty International put him on a watch list, and at that point, it protected his life. He couldn't be killed, even though he was still refusing to sign this piece of paper that would be something that probably any of us would sign and not think a big deal about. But he said that he couldn't sign the piece of paper because the only freedom he had was in his mind. And if he lost that freedom, that would be death for him. So he's in prison, he's composing poetry, writing it on onion skins, you know, pricking, his, pricking himself to give him blood, to get blood, to write this poetry that's a really tiny. And he drew, he did paintings of his wife that were like this, you know, just barely bigger than a postage stamp that were beautiful. He's now a renowned artist, and they had some of his art and poetry on display at this event. While he was there, he, and it was just, I just want to say, it was amazing to be in the presence of someone who was willing to sacrifice so much for his conscience. And while he was there at this religious liberty conference, he was praising the Little Sisters of the Poor for what they have done in their fight against the Obama administration, refusing to be part of this sexual, new sexual orthodoxy at great cost to themselves. And as he praised them, you know, here's this great giant. They're crying, you know, and you see these little sisters all in their habits, crying, you know, as they're being praised. And it was, it was really inspiring to be around these people. And I think we need to think about these stories. And there's a fire truck out there. No, no worries. OK, I think it's just going by. Um, I was like, is there something you guys need to tell me right now? OK. <laughs> I think, so this moment that we're in, we have these stories of other people who are being persecuted. This is good for us. We have the stories of the martyrs from throughout the ages. And I think in some sense, seeing how quickly things are declining in this country can also be a gift. I think Christians have tended to kind of put faith in our government or our leaders. That is always wrong. We know the psalmist says, put not your trust in princes. And because we're self-governed, that means that we can't trust the American electorate, sadly. And, and if you would like evidence of that, you can look to the year 2016 for all the details you might need of just how far afield we've gotten in terms of our virtue, our morality, our civic education, the way we talk to each other, the quality of candidates that we put forth and whatnot. We're losing the allies that we have had in elite institutions, whether they die like Justice Scalia, they don't exist in the populace, so they can't be voted into office. And that means that things could get precipitously bad more quickly. I have a friend, Rod Dreyer, who's writing a book called The Benedict Option. And he told me of a well-known law professor who said that most Christians have no idea how bad it's going to get because they don't understand how much economic activity is tied to the government in terms of regulations, in terms of the control of the money, you know, like you pay for things and it passes through the government. And that gives them an ability to control the way you think through licensing and other forms of regulation. And I think, you know, the time could be coming that there will be economic losses affiliated with being a Christian, being an Orthodox Christian. Um, he said that, in his view, this law professor said, public schools are already lost, but most people don't know it. That, you know, you, you um, you will start to see mandated indoctrination into gay issues where gay straight alliances in schools will be like the Soviet youth clubs that people used to have to be part of. If you're not part of one, you're gonna have to explain why. It might hurt you when you apply to college. Accreditation will be denied to religious schools that don't follow the new rules. You might not get access to top law schools, medical schools, or professional organizations unless you agree with what these new doctrines are. We've already seen this happen with Catholics and the British medical system. But I think California gives us a good glimpse of how it could happen in this country. And I'm sure you're thinking, and rightly so, like we're so unlike California that we don't need to worry about it. But there's a speed with which this stuff is happening and filtering from 
states that are far gone, like my former state of California, to states that should have a little bit more common sense. California begins LGBT training on LGBT issues in kindergarten by state law. They recently tried to remove the exemption for religious schools, like colleges, on some of these sexual orthodoxy issues, which would have been utterly devastating to all traditional religious schools in California, including Concordia Irvine. And thankfully, everyone who would have been affected organized so effectively that they did pull the legislation for the time being, but they did say they're gonna try and work around it in other means, so it's not a battle that's done. And pro-abortion groups are trying to force medical schools to mandate abortion education, to make it so that you know, if you wanna be part of a medical society, you have to agree that abortion is okay, euthanasia is okay. Colorado, another state I lived in, just put on the ballot something about killing people. And I would not say Colorado is in a good situation to fight that legislation. And progressive law theorists are speaking more openly about how they would like to take even more power and activism in the courts should their preferred candidate win the presidential election. They will push to repeal RIFRA. Um, the decisions regarding religious liberty will be in that Justice Kennedy style, not the, the style of Roberts or Alito or Thomas. Dreyer told me from another correspondent that one litigator told him that the thing most ordinary Christians don't understand about all this is that there's never going to be an end to it. There will never be a point at which they say, we're satisfied. He said the nature of their disorder is such that it can never be fully satisfied. This is something Christians are going to have to be dealing with for the rest of our lives, and it's going to be so much worse than most of us can yet imagine. Thus concludes the cheerful part of my presentation. Okay, but seriously, that is the, that is the worst case scenario, and I think you know, it, it might be overstating it a bit, but what do you do in this, what do you do if this is the situation? I think one thing to do is man up. Like, keep some perspective here. We aren't being beheaded. We aren't being killed. If someone tells you at your university that you're gonna face some repercussions if you don't agree with them on their doctrines, so, didn't you know that was what, it, didn't you say that you knew that would happen in your confirmation vows? Like, learn to deal with a little bit of adversity, and more than that, by not learning how to deal with it, by not being bold, you actually enable the bully to, to go after other people. It's a service that you provide not just for your, own, for your own self, it's a service you provide to your neighbor in Christ. Other people might not be as strong as you are, so you owe it to them to stand up when people bully you, to renounce your faith or renounce your beliefs so that they, that, so that they will have someone to stand with. Um, another thing I think is that you have to be really educated as a consumer of media and culture to understand that there is a propaganda effort, not that it's just going on, it's been going on for decades, and just become a, a consumer who's aware of that as you consume your news, as you watch a movie, as you watch a TV show. This is a concerted effort to change your morals and values. Not being aware of it is a really good way to fall under their power. Standing up against mob hysteria is very important. Something as simple as making sure that people don't control your language or pervert your language. So even something as simple as understanding that the word sex refers to male and female. It's not gender, it's sex. If you're male, that's your sex. If you're female, that's your sex. It's not gender. As my Latin teacher liked to say, um, people have sex, words have gender. It's a really good way to remember. You know, gender is a, is a grammar term. And this is an objective reality, and it's not something that you can rewrite or pretend isn't real. And just owning control of your brain and your language is half the battle. Um, what else? So yeah, fight for precision in our language, fight for free speech. Be willing to ridicule those who are ridiculous. I think there's actually a service there in, in acknowledging when people are being ludicrous. I think sometimes we can be so taken aback that we don't point out how ridiculous it is. At the same time, cultivate the art of friendship because so much of this new totalitarianism is about driving people apart from each other and sowing division. 
And specifically, I think this is important for those of us in the church. Um, first, I'll just point out, like, in the 16th century, Martin Luther's books were being confiscated. They were banned. They were burned. I mean, there were all sorts of problems happening with his teachings. We don't burn books anymore, but we still try and stamp out ideas that are threatening, and that is what's happening to us right now. People are trying to stamp out the truth. And it's important that we fight using every means that we have in this country. We still do have good religious liberty protection. We need to use it, we need to fight for it, and we need to fight valiantly. Again, not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors. This is an important um, thing. And it's also just, it's what our form of government provides, and we should, we should appreciate that. And I think also understand that the persecution that we face is not abnormal, it's actually quite normal. If anything, the lack of persecution that we have faced in this country is what's really abnormal throughout the history of the church. And lack of persecution isn't even necessarily good for the church. We are promised persecution. We, Christ tells us, blessed, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I mean, Christ himself telling us that this is a blessing to be persecuted. And finally, I would just also say I think it's important that we love those who hate us. This is, there's a St. John Chrysostom quote. Do not say then, I am hated, and that is why I do not love for this is why you ought to love most. And he points out it's not in the nature of man to hate those who love him. So it's actually a great evangelism method to just continue to show love to those who persecute you and hate you. And this is a good way for us to embark on our next you know, phases of prayer, receiving word and sacrament, being faithful in our devotions. And rejoicing in whatever comes our way. We know it's a blessing no matter what comes our way, so we should just be prepared and, in a sense, look forward to it. So that's the conclusion of my, what I want to talk about, about persecution. But we can talk about anything else, and we can do that now. Or we can talk about sixth century saints, because I've got some notes on that, too. No, too. Did I mention that the committee that I'm, that I'm on a committee at my church called the St. Lawrence Committee? I think this is what all churches should come, come up with, a St. Lawrence Committee. It's good, it's good. Yes, but you have to come up to the microphone. Yes. Okay, great. expressing their bias. So I guess what I want, could you tell us as an insider what, it, what, it, what that experience has been like for you when you go on CNN? What's it like? So it's interesting. I have to first say that the, the publication that I'm part of has staff or yeah, people who actually work to get us on television. And my lady who handles public relations has said that I'm never allowed to say anything negative <laughs> about TV news, but I'd like to just do it anyway. So, because um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a field where people are very sensitive to criticism. But I think, 
you know, it, it's, it's fair for me to, to speak a little bit freely on, on the problems that television news has. I would say, and there were media ecologists, it's called media, media critics, Neil Postman and others who identified the problem with TV news being that it was entertainment back in the 60s. So this is not a new problem, it is actually, there's something about the nature of it, it's a production. You, you get hair and makeup done, you have costuming, you have lights. It's just like being in a theater production, so of course it's gonna have some, it's gonna be built around the entertainment model. That's not all bad in that it's a way to make money, people like to be entertained, and you wanna keep things going. I was thinking about this while watching the Olympics. Bob Costas had those delightful gymnasts on it was like the worst television I had ever seen. I don't know why, but they just were kind of rambling. They clearly hadn't had media training. He seemed tired. His questions weren't good. And I'm like, what am I watching? And then I thought, I'm actually probably watching one of the rare, real moments of Olympics coverage that's out there, just like two teenage girls talking about how they like boys. And, you know, it was weird, but it was kind of refreshing to see something genuine come across. But generally speaking, people want highly polished productions. And they want to be entertained. And the fault is not necessarily with the people producing the news that they are responding to market demands there. So part of the problem is us as a people. Um, having said that, I really do think that we, we will probably see some kind of shakeup in the news because I think people are kind of just getting sick and tired of the lack of substance and the lack of civility in a lot of these discussions that you see fights are more entertaining than agreement. I mean, one of the things they teach you when you're doing media training is do not agree with the other person. Like, you're never supposed to say, that's a good point, or I agree with you. Think about what that does to civil discourse when you can never admit that someone who's on the other side has made a good point. Like, this is just a basic part of being human and good is that you can acknowledge when someone else makes a good point, but it's really bad television. It's not entertaining. So there are things about it that really have contributed to the breakdown in civil discourse. You know, also that people don't seem to want to have huge chunks of time devoted to any topic. So if you're talking about something, you get like literally a minute, two and a half minutes to talk about it. I mean, it, it, you only get a few hundred words maximum. When I'm writing a piece about a complex topic, it could go 5,000 words. You're not getting 5,000 words on television. You know, so there are main problems. I think we need to, as a people, consider how much visual news is healthy for us and make sure that we are, if we are watching it, make sure you're seeking out sources of information from other people so that you can make better, more informed decisions. The microphone. Sorry. I don't want other people yelling at me for not getting people to the mic. This guy's really mean right here, so. Hey, um, yeah, I uh, live very close here to Zion, kind of in the middle part of the city. Um, and I know one thing that concerns me a lot I see now is, uh, media reporting on things like Black Lives Matter, uh, where they will uh, promote a narrative that is not even close to reality. And then based on that false narrative, you have literally inner cities on fire. Uh, and there is not even a hint of accurate reporting. Uh, and the result is deadly. Uh, and that concerns me gravely about uh, our media, and I hold our media directly responsible for what's going on with, with things like Black Lives Matter and the danger and destruction that, she, that they're creating. I think that's a really good example of how media coverage does not help a situation. I am so angry at the media coverage of what happened in Ferguson that I cannot believe anything that I read or watch about a shooting, even when it sounds horrifically bad. And I am pretty sympathetic to the idea that law enforcement, that there are actors in law enforcement who 
behave poorly. But because of the way that the media put forth so many falsehoods about that Ferguson story, I refuse to believe whatever they're saying. I believe them, not uncritically, but I still believe them at some point. You know, I, I believed at least, I was, I was skeptical, but I still listened to what they were saying about Ferguson. So much of what they said there was just a complete and utter falsehood from uh, hands up, don't shoot, to what they claimed was, you know, totally verified information about the nature of that shooting. I mean, that the highly politicized Obama Department of Justice didn't do anything in that situation tells you exactly how much the media messed up that story. At the same time, there really are these complicated, serious issues about, you know, breakdown of the black family, breakdown of the black community, how police handle policing in communities where there is family breakdown versus other communities that don't have the same problems. These are very complicated topics dealing with everything from our welfare policy that encourages that family breakdown, you know, historical racism, um, just like all sorts of problems that the media can't talk about in a minute and a half of yelling at each other about a false narrative. And it has, it's, it's heartbreaking how much it has hurt you know, just relationships in communities and between police and the people who they serve and they're supposed to serve and protect. Um, it makes, I think it actually might exacerbate the situation in some ways. The, the bad media coverage might make cops even more nervous and um, liable to second guess their judgment, which is not exactly healthy in all cases. So it is one of the, I think the media look at their coverage of the of the movement as one of the highlights of the last two years, and I would say it's actually one of the low lights. And it really, I don't think, I don't think it's been good for people. So I do hope that people will work on, you know, all the issues in the communities of bringing peace and comfort and helping people who do feel, um, you know, persecuted or treated differently on account of their skin color. Those are important issues, and the church should be reaching out with everybody to heal those wounds. The religious unity, how much does that um, contribute to some of this, uh, to, to some of the societal problems we have? Because like my son-in-law is a pastor in Madison, Wisconsin, and he is right in the middle of the LGBT community. And he said all the churches in his area will fly a rainbow flag. And his is the only church that doesn't. So how much do you see the religious community contributing to the problem? Right. I think I was thinking about some of that with regard to how the totalitarian or post-totalitarian system that we're in will cause breakdowns in communities. And I think that some of the first and most hurtful betrayals will happen within the Christian church. Uh, there are many Christians who seek, or seem to seek, I don't know, it seems uncharitable to put it this way. There are Christians who are compromising their doctrines to be in line with social trends. And that is really hurtful when the whole Christian church can't stick together. Imagine if we all had one voice on on the um, persecution of unborn children. That would be powerful. When you have people who claim to be pastors saying that abortion is fine, I mean, that does a real disservice to real lives that are being snuffed out every day. It's a betrayal, and it's a hurtful and harmful betrayal. And it's also just, you know, we, we need to stick together so that we help each other and those who are weaker. But at the same time, we should all be humble about where we've been. We know, there have been times when we did not have the right views or that someone took the time to educate us and instruct us in, in the proper way to be. And I think that even if you're dealing with you know, a hostile Christian church body, we still show love, we still reach out, and do not be surprised that I was reading this Luther quote about how he was happy that he didn't agree with the Pope. 
he was happy that the Pope was persecuting him or something like this because you know, he was promised persecution and he wouldn't want, he, you know, the Pope was such a bad guy, he wouldn't want to agree with him on anything anyway. It was a very particular, you know, Pope in time, but there's something to be said, you know, sometimes you look at what these churches are teaching and how they perverted the gospel, you don't want to be in agreement with them. It's a, it's a testament to what we teach that they disdain what we teach. first part of your presentation, you talked about the media speaking through groupthink. And I just wanted to ask you to clarify what you mean by that, because I think that's a really important point that you were making, that they're not necessarily a grand conspiracy, but they're so wrapped up in this ideology. So could you explain that a little more and maybe touch on how you think social media plays was, into that group thing? I was going to answer by talking about social media, because I think that's um, a big reason why groupthink has gotten worse. I think that our media tend to all have the same perspective because they all tend to be coming from the same general socio-economic environment. They tend to be middle class, upper middle class people. They tend to have gone to the same types of schools. They all studied journalism. When I got a job at this one newspaper, I had to get a special dispensation because I didn't have a journalism degree. I had an economics degree. That's ludicrous. You don't learn anything in journalism school. My husband got a journalism degree and he, he swears that you do not learn anything in journalism school. The idea that you wouldn't want like a history major, an econ major, but you would want someone who like sat around doing what? Nothing. I don't even know what they do. Um, it's, it's just ludicrous. And it was really shown to be ludicrous when we were covering the federal budget and I was the only person who knew how to read a budget because they'd all gone to journalism school. So they all come from these same neighborhoods. They all you know, they t tend to be white. They tend to have the same economic background. They tend to read the same, they have the same influencers. And that has always been the case. And then what happens with social, I just want to tell one more story about how similar they are in their sociocultural status. We, I worked for a newspaper that covered the military and they had a problem of basically everyone who worked at the newspaper was white and the military is really racially diverse and it was just a weird thing that everyone who worked at the newspaper was like looking one way and the people we were covering looked all sorts of different ways and you know they were really confused as how this had happened when they require a journalism degree. <laughs> who do you think is going to journalism school? Anyway, we had people who had worked in the military who were working as support staff at our newspaper, like doing business management, answering phones, like all that type of stuff, who knew what it was like to be in the military, it does not take much to learn how to write, trust me, and they wouldn't hire these people because they didn't necessarily have college degrees and they certainly didn't have journalism degrees. That's just, you know, that just shows you just how narrow their understanding is, even when they're trying to hire a more diverse field, they can't figure out to hire the people who are literally under their nose. So it gets to social media where what I love about social media is that all these journalists are signaling to each other at all times how they're putting up their green grocery signs. You know, don't, I'm a good person, I'm not a bad person, I'm safe. So they just constantly, whenever a news story comes out, they mock the right people or they praise the right people. And it just becomes this echo chamber where you, you see them see that enough other people are expressing a viewpoint that they want, to sh they want to be part of that too. And so you can just watch it online grow and expand. And I have like a disease or something that makes it, when I see people all marching in that direction, I'm like, I better go that way because I don't trust what's happening over there. And it really can be almost silly how much I can take it to the opposite extreme. But there aren't really many contrari contrarians in journalism, which is, I guess, um, the danger of being a contrarian is that you do stand out, so you might be ridiculed, and if it doesn't work out, there's more at risk than if you kind of stay with the pack, and if you fail, you could say, well, everybody else failed on this story in the same way, too. I feel compelled to mention that my mother, my, my awesome, I have an awesome mother and father, my dad's a pastor, and um, 
they are both converts to Lutheranism, but they embraced it like they were the original Lutherans or something. And they, you know, my mom converted as an adult, but she would always talk about being Lutheran as if we were these exotic creatures. Like she would go, like if I, under, if I had a question like, why did this happen that was something contrary to the faith, she'd go, oh, Americans do that. We do this. It was like we were Russian spies or something like, oh, the Americans, they do that. But I really had this sense of being apart and being comfortable being apart. And I think it's a good gift to give your children to, you know, this is particularly important for where I live where very few people share, like in our neighborhood, very few people share our beliefs on any number of things. So when children encounter something and it's contrary to what we would teach, I just explain, you know, basically, the Americans do that, we do this. And I hope that that will help my children not be so surprised that they will need to be standing against culture a lot in the days to come. Uh, so, this uh, presidential election uh, has, well, one of the issues that's been brought up is... I am not going to talk about the... No, just kidding. <laughs> I am scared to talk about... No. One of the issues that's been brought up is the Supreme Court. Uh, what's going to happen with the future of that? Um, could you talk about what you think might or might not happen as far as religious liberty and Supreme Court justices, depending on who wins, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's actually one of the more interesting issues is the Supreme Court, and it's probably going to be one of those issues that people end up voting on. And I, you know, just speaking totally personally, and I feel compelled to do that because I'm speaking inside of a sanctuary and there are, you know, rules about it. I'm just speaking for myself and, and no one else here, but I will talk about it. I mentioned that the progressive legal activists are openly stating that if Hillary wins, they will go on the aggressive. They will, they will become they're, they're gonna go for as much as they can get, as quickly as they can get it. That means a radical revision in how we understand self-government, limited government. Um, it would mean making the administrative state, which is that sort of unaccountable bureaucracy, even more powerful. Most of the religious liberty threats that we face don't come because Congress passes legislation or because of something like that. It's because the administrative state, the bureaucracy, gets permission from Congress to write regulations. They become like judge, jury, and executioner of these regulations. When Congress passed the very controversial, completely ridiculous Affordable Care Act, they didn't say you were going to have to pay for abortions against your conscience but they allowed enough leeway in how HHS, the Health and Human Services Department, could write that legislation that HHS went for broke and they're gonna keep on going for broke. That's a, that's, they can change how they write those regulations year after year after year to just keep getting more and more and more from people and to restrict liberty. I think you'll see a lot of that in every sphere of regulation. Um, and of course, the, the sexual agenda will be huge, the abortion agenda will be huge. So it's, it's a pretty serious threat. And so you have, the Republicans have nominated someone who, you know, I don't think a lot of people know how it will go if he is to be elected. But, you know, he did a few months ago ask good people for names of Supreme Court justices, and he said that he would pick justices of that type. At other times, he said that his sister, who's one of the most radical pro-abortion progressive types, would also make a good justice. So it's, you know, it's kind of like pick and choose which thing you want to believe, but he did ask for a good list. He said for a few hours, I think, that he would stick to that list, and then he said, well, you know, whatever. Um, but I think generally speaking, oh, uh, gosh, sorry, it's very tricky. I, don't, I mean, I don't think anyone knows. It's probably better people would be around him on the issues of religious liberty. It's not an issue that he has shown a great deal of concern or knowledge about, but the people around him definitely have. So if 
that's an important, I mean, I, I don't know. Was that, did that just show my utter confusion about this election and what the right thing to do is? And I would say, that I would say it's pretty clear that the peop, Hillary Clinton's been pretty consistent on this throughout her career in a way that apart from 1993 when I just presumed she was in favor of what her husband signed into law, since then she's tended to side with, and even then, but continuing on, t tended to side with progressive legal activists. That's not a good thing. Okay, bye. Can you speak a little bit about what it's like to be a female working in your profession, especially when a lot of female journalists tend to side with feminist ideology and how you've had to deal with that a little bit in your career? Okay, I would like to talk about that, but I just thought of something else related to the prior issue, which is that I was at the Republican National Convention. I got to cover both conventions, and during Donald Trump's acceptance speech, he mentioned an, an IRS regulation that prohibits people from endorsing candidates from the pulpit. This is an IRS regulation that was pushed, I think, by LBJ and has never been enforced. But it's on the books, which has a very profound chilling effect on people. This is not an issue that really affects Lutherans because Lutherans very nicely separate what's happening at the pulpit, which is about preaching God's word and the forgiveness of sins from domestic politics, which is usually an issue people in good conscience can disagree about, like on a candidate or whatnot. Since God does not tell you who to vote for in the 2016 election, clearly that, you know, most pastors would not, most Lutheran pastors would not even waste their time on, on such a trivial issue relative to eternal salvation. But it is an issue for people who mix those two kingdoms, and they have been working to fight it. And I just thought it was funny that Tim Kaine is a Roman Catholic who supports abortion rights, so whatever that means. But he is a member of a church in Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> and that church tweeted out like, congratulations to Tim Kaine, our member who has been picked for vice president. And that's a violation of that IRS statute to speak from an official capacity in favor of even your own congregant who you're just trying to say like, hey there, buddy, good job. And they had said something on their Facebook page. And while I was writing about this, they pulled everything down. Like they had to pull down their whole social media presence. And in retrospect, I thought it was kind of ridiculous at first that Donald Trump talked about that issue in his convention speech, but within a week or so, it showed that it really is an issue that afflicts churches. It happened to be his opponent's church, and would, you know, which is kind of funny, but, um, you know, so that, that might show something positive in that regard. But, um, okay, so being a female in journalism, I would like to share how at The Federalist, we explicitly wanted more female readers than most political publications have. Women vote in numbers greater than men, but they don't read political publications. And that's true whether they are liberal political publications, conservative, or especially libertarian, which is populated almost entirely by men. And we seek out female writers, we seek out stories, uh, that would be of interest to women. We have female editors, and we don't write boring policy pieces that I don't understand how anybody wants to read them, male or female. And it has worked out really well for us. We have a ton of, of female readers. We're still read by a majority men, but much, much better numbers than anyone else has in the business. And it, it's something that I'm really proud of because we've worked really hard to have political, cultural, and religious content that would appeal broadly. And 
I think what it shows, too, is that there is a hunger and need. There are a lot of women who have not had our voices heard because most of the media are these like radical feminists who don't understand why a woman would want to raise her family or would make career sacrifices to do so or why, yeah, basically that. Most of the media messages that you get are that career is the only thing that matters to a woman. And that's just not true. That's not just not true for conservative women. That's actually not true for the, for the vast majority of women, period. Most women seek a work-life balance. Most women find a lot of value in their homemaking and things outside of this drive to get the corner office. And so we'll write these, or we'll publish these really basic pieces that are just from that perspective, and they do gangbusters on hits. You know, just like pro-baby making stuff, like, you know, we've had people just talk about what it's like to have a large family, or lessons learned, or the joys of pregnancy, or what it's like to have a miscarriage. You know, these types of articles that you just don't see in other publications, and it's a good way to also talk about larger issues, about feminine virtue, about um, the importance of womanhood, importance of women in our society, and it, but they're always really common sense things. So it's, I feel alienated from most major mainstream media, female media types, because they all tend to have that feminist perspective, but having a different perspective has been really good business for us. Since I'm on video, I'll also share another secret. What could go wrong with this? But um, another thing that I really, one of our things that we care about is not being too inside the beltway. Do you know what that means? Like not having that same perspective of people who live right there in that DC bubble. I happen to live in the DC bubble, but the important thing is not to have the perspective of someone who lives there. And we like to have writers who are not professional writers who have really good, interesting, new, fresh takes on politics or culture. And my secret arsenal is that I have a ton of Lutheran women write for me. I mean, I don't think people would recognize the names right away, but I learned that there's nothing better than like a homeschool mom who went and got a classics degree and thinks all day about how to explain Greek poetry to her seven-year-old, that woman will write an amazing piece about the current moment, political challenges. It'll be deep, it'll be interesting, and it will be able to be read by a lot of people. There are people who know a lot of things, but they can't write in English. <laughs> and I also, we also have a ton of Lutheran pastors, because Lutheran pastors are great at, you know, they write sermons each week, they use a fresh news hook. They write really balanced things about law and gospel. And it's such a fresh and interesting take in a world where you've got left and right and they're screaming at each other. And to have someone who just kind of cuts down the middle, says what's good about both sides, also says what's bad about both sides. I mean, these pieces do great. And people are like, where do you find these writers? And I'm like, you know, just around. It's Lutherans. I find Lutheran writers. It's, anyway. So on that note, if any of you are good Lutheran writers, you know. Okay. I think that, any, this is, this is it. Anything else? Okay, well, I hope I have not discouraged you all with my doom and gloom scenario. I really do think we have all the reason for hope in Christ. I, I do not see a conflict between being aware of how dire the situation is culturally with that hope. And in fact, that's, um, that's why it's not a sad story at all that we have this faith, which is such good news. So thank you very much for letting me be with you today. And
What a joy and privilege it was to have you with us and to share that perspective uh, that we out here in South Dakota don't very often get some of that insider perspective on politics and media and culture. So thank you, Molly, for coming. Before you go, let me send you on your way with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection changed the world. Bathed in his blood, this world is changed, sins forgiven, hope restored, joy infused in us, that no matter how dark the days seem, no matter how oppressive the culture might be, the victory ultimately belongs to you. And we sing that praise to the Lamb who was slain, who was risen again, and sits at your right hand, and whose coming we anxiously await. We thank you for Molly Hemingway and the work that she does in your name for the Federalist and for all the work that she does in lifting you up in a world that is dark and needs to see that light. We thank you for all media and journalism, uh, for those uh, who inform us and provide us with information and perspectives. We thank you for good government, Lord, for you have established it for our good. And we ask you to bless our legislators and those who make and administer our laws, that they may do so recognizing that you have placed them in positions of authority for your good and not for theirs. Lord, now as we go our homeward way, Remind us that we each have vocations in this world, places in our culture and families and in this world that you have given us that we might share you and your gospel message with all people we visit and talk with. Help us to build those relationships with people who do not know you, that we might share that good news with them, that their lives too might be transformed in the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grant us a peaceful night and a quiet rest. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.